At Desjardins Online Brokerage, we provide high-performance Disnap platforms so you can invest online with no commission fees on stocks and exchange-traded funds. We also offer tools and free training courses. Plus, we've been ranked highest in investor satisfaction among self-directed brokerage firms by J.D. Power. Visit Disnat.com. Certain conditions apply. For J.D. Power 2023 award information, visit JDPower.com slash awards. 2023 has been an interesting year in Canadian politics. It started out with... Well, the two main federal parties tied. Now it looks like if an election were held today, it would be a runaway in Alberta. Danielle Smith won re-election at a time when it looked like she was destined for defeat. And Doug Ford, well, he got pummeled this year, and he's still sitting on top. How does all this work? Hello, my name's Brian Lilly. This is the Full Comment Podcast. Welcome to the show, and I hope you enjoy this year in review. I decided that in order to unpack all this, I'd turn to... Two of the smartest gents that I know in politics, two men that I've known for a long time who are friends. Corey Tanike is a uh, conservative strategist, I guess you'd call yourself, Corey. You've been in politics a long time on winning campaigns, on losing campaigns. You've been up and you've been down. Um, And Warren Kinsella used to run liberal campaigns. Now he's a homeless liberal. (laughs) <laughs> so you're not actually homeless, Warren, but uh, you're joining us today from Prince Edward County. Corey, you're joining us from Montreal. And while people might think that, uh, well, this is uh, three middle-aged white guys from central Canada all talking, but all of us have worked in very or lived and worked in various parts of the country and, and know the political scene. So, gents, thanks for joining me. Glad thanks to be here. Her. Is that the right way to describe you, Warren? You're a homeless liberal? Yeah, it is, actually. Um, I had the great fortune of having dinner with my former boss, uh, Jean Crescia, on Sunday night in Ottawa and get caught up. And um, that's kind of what I said to him. I said, you know, I don't I don't really belong anywhere these days. But I said to him, by the same token, I get the, the sense that there's quite a few people, voters, regular folks, who feel the same way that they're they're kind of without any political moorings, but you know that's all right. In the United States, uh, independent is considered a actual registrable political category. So, so I guess I've got company. All right, uh, Corey, you're you're not homeless. <laughs> no, no, I'm 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 pretty pretty comfortably ensconced in the Conservative Party, but uh, <clears throat> but there's always lots of room for. Uh, Differences of uh, opinion within whatever party you're in, as as uh, I think it was Churchill said, your opponents are in the other side of the house. Your enemies are all in your own party. Um, it's uh, there's there's a little bit of truth to that. In- intramural always seems to be a little rougher than uh, than the than the stuff with the guys across the floor. Let's talk about. Um, we'll go through and we'll discuss how various politicians have done this year, and we'll start with the guy at the top, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Um, you know, it was uh, just the other day, Pierre Polyev told him to take a walk in the snow. Everyone loves to use that, that term from his father's time. And he said, it's time for you to go. Uh, it, at the beginning of the year, Justin Trudeau wasn't in bad shape. What happened over the last year, Corey, in your view, that brought him to where it's, according to several polls now, a 19 point gap between him and Polyev's conservatives? Well, I think it's as it's, it's, it's much things they didn't do as things that they did do. And I think it's it's chickens uh, coming home to roost that, uh, that left the barn long ago. Uh, I, you know, the, the carbon tax is really starting to bite. And we're in a period of as Canadians uh, feeling you know, very, very uh, uh, huge concerns about uh, how they're going to pay their mortgage, you know, uh, cost pressures on their family budgets, etc. And, uh, you know, at the same time, this has been... Coming, uh, you know, being, becoming a reality in people's lives. You're seeing, you're seeing a carbon tax sort of front and center as something that's making their life more difficult, and uh, and that narrative has has been uh, put out there. I think extremely effectively by by uh, Pierre Polyev, who you know I, I, I notice has continued to kind of innovate uh, around how he presents his messages on the internet in a way that's connecting with a lot of voters. So 
you know, I, I think the, the conservatives have a story and and the liberals have, have lost the script is, is kind of what I would Warren, say. Warren, there was a time when the liberals would have easily just turned around and said, well, the carbon tax is for the environment and you obviously don't care about the environment. And that would have worked with a lot of voters. It doesn't seem to be working now. They're trying that, but it doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, and it, it relates to my my theory about politics. It's never one thing that kills you. It's always a bunch of things. And um, for sure, you know, their reversal on the carbon tax, which, you know, to be fair to them, was in, you know, a number of their platforms. They said they were going to do it. They received a mandate from the people to do it. And then they started to do it and people got mad. And, uh, you know, I, th- I, I don't think it's just that. I think it relates back to what the two of you were saying just a minute ago. Uh, it, it, people, you know, if you're there for a long time, people just get sick of you. They get sick of your face. And Justin Trudeau has been the Liberal Party leader for more than a decade. He has been the Prime Minister for more than eight years. And like I think all of us know, whether you're Team Blue or Orange or Red, like eight years is about all you get. Like that's it. And, you know, at that point, you got to either start looking at the exits because like if you don't walk out on your own feet, you're going to be carried out in a pine box. And I think... To, to, you know, Trudeau, I don't, I don't like his style of leadership, but you don't get to be prime minister by being a dummy. And he's not stupid. And I, too many conservatives, I find, fall into the trap of, not the two of you, but you guys know what I'm talking about, believe he's stupid. Well, he's it, not stupid. It's that thing where people, um, and I, I, I think the liberals are doing this with Polyev, you believe that the public hates your opponent as much as you do. And that's exactly. kind of... Exactly. Well, in your own spin, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of confirmation bias that you see in politics uh, amongst people who are, are working in it. It was uh, that you saw this in a similar way to what I think uh, you're talking about, Warren, with with George Bush. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, progressives and liberals in the states, you know, used to kind of mock him like he was a dummy. He's not a dummy. Um, uh, yeah, but he. he it's it's the flip side of the same coin. When you're a very charismatic sort of celebrity figure, which is is how he came into office, you you get the pluses of that persona and and that charisma, but you also get the negatives that come with it. You know, what was the the uh, uh, the old joke about how uh, politics was uh, for uh, was famed for for ugly people? And then the retort was that uh, that uh, Hollywood is uh, uh, is politics for stupid people. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there's a plus minus that, you know, he both benefits from in terms of that celebrity aspect of his personality and, and comes with some downsides. And one of them is that people don't uh, treat you like, uh, uh, the guy with the most intellectual horsepower on the stage. Yeah, but, but Warren has a point. You don't get to be prime minister by being stupid. Yeah, he's not dumb. He's, he's not yeah, dumb at all. I mean, you know, I, I, I we, you we've know, all <clears> talked <throat> to him. Uh, he may not be, um, you know, a candidate for Mensa, but I, I, I I I I just I disagree with him profoundly on a number of things, but I, you know that's that's different than 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 thinking that he's dumb. So, I, Warren, you said it's um, a bunch of little things that that do you in, not normally one big thing. Corey, last time you and I spoke, I think you described it as pebbles in your backpack. Every day you're in power, there's another pebble in your backpack. Uh, is this just eight years of of, of things wearing down? It's more than that. Like I, I think they made some pretty big strategic errors, um, and and they're maybe driven out of out of you know things that are you know not entirely within their control. Like th- I think they made a big mistake not framing uh, Polyev as soon as he came into office and allowing him to to roll out a multi million do- dollar ad campaign uh, and to introduce himself to to Canadians in a positive way as opposed to introducing him in a negative way through their advertising. I think that was a huge strategic error. Warren and I talked about it at the time last September when he, uh, when Polyev won, we said, you know, where, where are the ads? And I said to him, we, you and I could write the attack ads against Pierre. Uh, And and I know them and I like the guy, but you still know where his weak points are. They didn't do any of that. No. And what I do, 
you know, I, it's nice of you to say I run campaigns. Uh, I didn't. I just ran parts of campaigns, and I did uh, had the great fortune of having a great candidate and team to support, Kretzian in 93. So I did the first war room, and, and in 2000 I did it, and I did them for McGinty. And what are they? And it's really just, you know, telling a war room, you know, political people try to make it into this great, you know, mysticism and, you know, special science, and it's not. All we did – is just kind of defend our guy and our team and highlight the weaknesses of the other side. And, you know, there, with Pierre Polyev, guys, like it is a target rich environment. And I too am mystified why they did not go after him on his many obvious uh, weaknesses. I do believe that, you know, the stratospheric heights that he's reaching in the polls right now, um, I think he's going to drop because I think he's probably peaking a little bit too soon. I don't think the Liberal Party uh, is going to just remain on the mat and let him walk to, you know, one of the biggest majorities in Canadian political history. He's got some vulnerabilities, but for sure what Corey is saying is absolutely right. As a war room guy, I am just mystified by the fact that they let him define himself that's the job of a war room define or be defined and they let him define himself i I suspect money is is part of the answer as to why uh when you look at the the latest fundraising results they they look a lot like the the previous fundraising results that we've seen uh which is uh very anemic fundraising uh for an incumbent Uh, and i don't know if you saw the um uh, the story out, um, we'll give credit to CBC and Rafi at their uh, parliamentary bureau. Uh, a large group of Muslim donors just uh, wrote to the party president and said, we're leaving the Laurier Club because of your your refusal or the prime minister's refusal to call for an absolute ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, these guys have apparently raised, uh, you know, just a, you know, a small group of them raised uh, over a million dollars for the liberals over the past few years. So their fundraising is about to take a hit. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I think. I think the Israel-Gaza conflict has has been a problem for them. I think it's been challenging for progressive parties ar- around the world uh, uh, because it splits uh, some of their voter coalition and some of their you know high end supporter base. And but so I don't. It's, it's hard. Sorry, I. But it, you know the money thing, guys. We all know it. Like you're limited statutorily to how much you can spend in a campaign, um, not so much before the campaign. And, you know, if money was everything, um, you know, Ross Perot would have been president of the United States in 92, right? Like it, it's, it's, it's not just money. Pete DuPont, whatever. It, what it is is, you know, having a great candidate and having a great message and a and a good team and all of those elements. You know, Corey has stitched those together for Doug Ford twice in circumstances where people said, "Oh, Doug Ford's a dummy; he couldn't possibly win." Well, you know, he did, and he won big. He won big the second, bigger the second time than he did the first time. So I think, um, you know, the 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 thing that Pierre Polyev has been most assisted by is what Kretzian said to me on Sunday night. Governments defeat themselves. And, you know, conservatives who are, you know, patting themselves on the back at the moment, I don't think should. Because really, their biggest asset is, is Justin Trudeau. Like, if Justin Trudeau leaves, guys, and I've seen this before a million times before, I know a lot of Tories who convince themselves, well, they're just walking to victory whoever is there. I do not believe that is the case. If this guy leaves, if he takes a walk in the snow, you know, this Christmas, let's say, he really can't go beyond February, I don't think. Um, like, it's a whole new ball game. Uh, whoever is there. Let's talk about that. Is he going to step down? I spent part of this week talking to uh, half a dozen liberals about what's going on, put it in a column, and it was a, a a matter of three different strains of thought. One, he's going, and he's been told, even by close family members, your time's up, you got to go. Two, nope. Another one said, uh, spoke to people who had dinner with him just a couple of weeks ago, and he's going to stick around. He thinks it's 2015, and that he'll come from behind and surprise everyone again. And then a third saying, I can't read him. He's putting up mixed signals. So, 
Corey, we'll start with you. What do you think he does? Uh, I think he stays. I think it's a mistake to stay, but uh, I think he stays. Uh, so I, I think there's a certain amount of arrogance when you're in that when you're in that role, and <clears throat> more people overstay their welcome uh, than walk out. That's that's sort of what the tradition has been, or the the norm has been, and uh, and I also think the things he's saying, you know, are. You know, you got to take it to a certain extent at face value. You know, I guess, you know, if I were to argue against myself on it, you know, you also have to say you're going to be there until the moment you say you're resigning or you have no ability to govern. But, you know, he's he's going out and he's, you know, projecting forward what he wants to talk about going into the next election. It's a little muddled, but like he's, you know, they're they're making attempts to do it. So, you know, I would say from where we're sitting today, it looks like he's staying what could make that change? Uh, you know, a caucus revolt, um, uh, more people coming out who start positioning for leadership, you know, uh, in, in a more aggressive manner than, uh, than we've seen today. Those things could affect it. A continued slide in the polls could continue to, to affect it. But, you know, where we're sitting today, he's staying. So, so if he goes to Ignatiev levels, <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. he walks. Well, they're getting close. They're getting close. You know, like what, what, what is, you know, what, what is the threshold that I'm looking at when you see the NDP ahead of them in the polls? I think that's when they get into very, very serious trouble. And, uh, where I think the, the pressure inside caucus and elsewhere would, would increase, you know, dramatically. Warren. I don't know. Um, I don't know. You know, I, um, I, I can't figure out the psychology of this guy. On the one hand, he's probably saying to himself, well, you know, they said I wouldn't beat Harper, O'Toole, and Shear, and I did, and he did. Um, they always underestimate me before every campaign, and we do. Um, I'm a pretty good campaigner. They may not love me as prime minister, but I'm a pretty good campaigner. That is also true. But the, 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 on the other side of the equation, if he's smart, and I, as I say, he's not a dummy, like it's turning structural, right? It's becoming, since the month of May, he has been behind by double digits. It's now orbiting towards, you know, 15, 16 points. And as Corey just pointed out, you know, it's now moving into a save the furniture, furniture operation. But, He's either tied or behind the NDP and the rest of Canada. Yeah. So who talks to him, right? You know, every prime minister, every premier, every leader, they have their circle. They talk to people. And Brian, I think I know some of the people that he's referring to. People have spoken to him and said, you know, you're going to lose. You're going to get humiliated. But it is not a lot of people saying that. Because the one thing, the characteristic of the Trudeau government that's different than all of its predecessor liberal governments, besides from the fact that it's an NDP government, is that it is a cult, it truly is a cult of personality. He took those people, who are all now pensioned out, by the way, from third place to first. That's something that doesn't happen very often. They owe everything to this guy. And this is why I don't think you see, for the first time in the Liberal Party's history, an obvious successor sitting in the wings. It, it, because, you know, Trudeau is, is it, right? And so there's nobody who can really get up on their hind legs and say to him, hey, big guy, you know, you're going to get your ass kicked. So are we. you got to go. Nobody's doing that. There's a very small group who have tried. And as I said at the start, I don't know if he's listening or not. Let's uh, let's talk about Pierre Polyev. How did he go from a uh, geeky policy wonk nerd to uh, you know jacked up apple munching slayer of journalists? <laughs> well, I think he's honed his trade uh, o- over the course of a number of years in politics. Uh, I think particularly in terms of his personal communications. Like I, I think he's, you know, revealing himself to be a bit of a master of the internet in terms of how he, uh, uses new media platforms, uh, to, to get clear, uh, messaging out. Uh, I, I, these sorts of, uh, uh, you know, mini documentary style videos where he's taking you through, a public policy problem and, and, and demonstrating that he has ideas and, and potential solutions. You know, how did we get into this trouble and how are we going to get out? 
And I look at, you know, the one that he, he did on, uh, on homelessness in Vancouver and these sort of 10 cities that we see cropping up across our, 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 our country. Uh, you know, and, and in addition to that, the zombie apocalypse, it seems to be spreading through every downtown of uh, people dealing with, you know, very serious addiction and mental health issues. Uh, and saying, like, look, the consensus around this uh, from the so-called clever people isn't working, and I have some other ideas. And, you know, he got a lot of criticism from the mainstream media about it, but, you know, the videos that he did uh, performed extremely well. And now you've seen him, you know, doing the same thing with carbon tax, doing the same thing with the housing crisis. Um, you know, I think it's very important in, in, in this atomized media environment that we're living in right now, to be able to have a mastery of of the YouTube explainer, and he's demonstrated that he can do that better than anyone else in the field right now. Warren, you've you've changed your view on him because you were not a fan, and, and I don't know that you are a fan now, but you seem to have softened on him. Yeah, um, well, I like you two guys, but I don't like anybody else. And, <laughs> um, and I am an old man, and, and you know, so I'm going to tell you a war story. Um, in 96, when I was moving to BC, because I'd gotten fed up with the Paul Martin people, quiet insurrection, and, um, you know, I was going to help out and help run Gord Cam Campbell's campaign. And before I got there, some of the tall foreheads decided, well, you know, he's being associated with Howe Street and too corporate and too successful, even though he, he personally wasn't. And, um, we're going to put him in lumberjack shirts and stuff. And I was just like, guys, when I got, and it didn't work, of course, it blew up in their faces. They got mocked. And the point I made to them when they bothered to listen is, you know, at a certain age in politics as in life, how you are is how you are. And voters in their wisdom can sense that, right? And the thing about Polyev that I, I've been kind of surprised and impressed by is I really do think he is a bit of a dick a lot of the time. Like he really is. He's not lovable in the way that Ralph Klein or Rennie Levesque or Jean Crancien or, you know, he's kind of a mean guy. And so how, you know, I've tried to figure out, because I'm supposed to think about these things, how has he gotten away with that? And I think he's gotten away with that because he matches the mood of the country. As Corey just pointed out, people are seriously grumpy. They're pissed off. They're angry. Even though proportionate, let's say in terms of the G7, our economy is functioning actually not badly. But nobody thinks that. You see this in the United States too. Biden's got full employment. He's got the economic definition of full employment, and people are still pissed off at him. So I think Polyev has really benefited from that. He's a very lucky guy. He's got a government that's busily defeating themselves, and you know he matches the mood of the country. However, God help him you know, if rates start to drop and people start to feel better about things and whatnot, the grumpy persona really isn't going to work. I, I don't find him grumpy I, I i never have i know when he was a pit bull and everyone has that role to play in different parties um but i haven't found him grumpy well yeah because he's winning no because he's what no he's winning right you know it's easy to feel like you know happy when you're kicking ass but when caucuser starts sniping at you and you got the media, you can't pick up a paper without somebody pissing on your shoes and, you know, fundraising's down and the numbers are not looking good. Well, then your mood tends to change. And so, yeah, for sure, he can eat apples and make fun of unprepared journalists and look like he's really smart. But like there comes a point in politics where, you know, people really get kind of unhappy with you. And I think he's he's been quite lucky right now. That's why I say to my Tory friends, for sure, yes, you're kicking ass, measure the drapes and the luxury block, do all of that stuff. But if Trudeau leaves, there is going to be a seismic shift. And it it's it's going to change kind of the fundamentals. It always does. That's why parties change leaders. And I don't think I don't think it I think Pierre Polyev is going to be prime minister. I, you know, I just don't think it's going to be juggernaut because we've all heard about juggernauts before and they never seem to work out. Well, yeah, I, that, that, you know, two, two data points to reinforce what, what, uh, Warren's saying. Cause I, I, I agree completely with, with that assessment. If we look back to 
you know, the last juggernaut, you know, when it was two years out from the campaign, um, after the, the, uh, massive landslide victory, Paul Martin, uh, in the leadership contest, you know, seat projections were like 220 seats. And two years later, they, they, you know, won by the skin of their teeth with a, with a slim minority government. So, uh, and likewise, if we look at the leadership change, you know, uh, you know, history reads like a hockey stick uh, graph when you, when, you know, when you look back on it, but, but let's remember that going into the 93 campaign, um, uh, Kim Campbell was, was leading <laughs> and, and, you know, and that happened like overnight, you know, the conservatives under Mulroney were kind of between nine and 11 points, like nine and 11 points. Think of what that, what that looks like. That's, that's like more than cutting in half what the liberal numbers are right now. And, and the liberal numbers are terrible. Think of just how low they were when they got up to 40, like they almost quadrupled their numbers through a leadership change. Now they ended up getting wiped out, but that wasn't, wasn't a guarantee that it was going to happen. And if I can jump on that war story, because I'm older than the two of you, both of you are, are kids and I'm the old guy. Like <laughs> Corey, you know, the Kim Campbell, I know it's easy to dismiss her now, but on the Canada Day weekend in 1993, Kim Campbell was the most popular prime minister in the history of polling. And she did that. It was, it was brilliant. She did that, you know, starting the day in Newfoundland and ending the day in Vancouver. And like, she could do no wrong. And, you know, Kretzian had people going bananas and caucus. That's the famous phrase, you know, he's talked about the nervous Nellies. That was about that. And like a leadership change can really occasion big shifts in the numbers. So that's why, you know, if Trudeau, for the first time in his life, you know, uh, kind of minimizes his ego and says, you know, what is best for the Liberal Party and what is frankly best for the country, I'm going to leave. I think it, it, it will cause a change and it'll make uh, Polyev work harder for the job. But that's good. That's good for the country and that's good for the Conservative Party. All right. We're running out of time on, on this segment, but I got to ask you, uh, Pierce had a couple of run-ins with the media. We mentioned the apple munching before, and then he had a pushback against the CP reporter. And is his voters love this. His base loves that. Does he have to be careful about not doing that too often uh, lest he turn off the the swing voters by being too assertive well i like i like the first embodiment of that and less so the second one like so you know while there's some obviously some similarities there's some very important differences uh the first one the apple eating one the the reporter was almost a you know central casting stooge for uh agenda journalism um, like just, you know, loaded question after loaded question, you know, cheap, cheap shot after cheap shot. And he just wasn't having any of it. In the second one, it was, you know, him being defensive about what was, you know, a small error, but an error. You know, he said that, uh, that, uh, you know, something that was a terror attack, you know, turned out not to be. And like, he got that wrong. Lots of other people got it wrong too, but, uh, the way he talked about getting it wrong wasn't, you know, quite accurate, but, uh, and it was also, you know, a, a, you know, a more defensive, I think, surly pushback against a young female journalist on something where, he, you know, he was the one who was a bit off with the facts. So, you know, I, I don't think they're the same. I don't think it hurt them at all. Like, you know, but, you know, it wasn't, wasn't his finest hour either. Uh, yeah, I feel the same way. And like, you know, does it work? For sure it works. You know, I wrote about in one of my books, you know, George W. Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush was losing, right? And, uh, Dan Rather brought him on to TV to beat him up over Iran-Contra. And, uh, Bush just summoned up the, the courage and the strength to just like go at Dan Rather. And the journalistic establishment was appalled and shocked and all the rest of it. But man, it worked like gangbusters for, for George Bush. And it, it eliminated the wimp image that he'd acquired up until that point. So yes, it does work periodically. You know, I work for a guy who strangled somebody on the lawn at Parliament Hill. And people, people dig that periodically, but you can't do it every day. And this relates back to the point I was making earlier. Like Polyev, you know, why is it that all the Kretschian people dislike Pierre Polyev? 
because you know most of us do, or we dislike one thing. When Jean Peltier, who was our chief of staff, was literally dying of cancer and was dragged before a parliamentary committee, he was dying. And Pierre Polyev just treated him with such contempt, called him a liar to his face. And like that kind of behavior, for sure, the base digs it, you know, and they, they like it when, you know, angry Pierre comes out and so on. But, you know, I, I point to the example of Tom Mulcair, you know, the, you know, people loved it in his base when he would be angry in the House of Commons and effective in committee, but like people don't want to see that all the time. And, you know, they want to see a different side of you. And Polyev has to be very careful about, you know, you know, kicking people when they're down too often, because at a certain point, it tells a story about you as a person and as a leader. All right. We've talked out the clock on federal stuff. We got to take a break. We haven't talked about Jagmeet Singh. Maybe that's because he doesn't matter, but he does because he's keeping the government in power. But we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll get into provincial stuff. Uh, what was the year like for Danielle Smith, for Doug Ford? Is Francois Legault going to flame out in 2024? All of that in a moment. At Desjardins Online Brokerage, we provide high-performance Disnap platforms so you can invest online with no commission fees on stocks and exchange-traded funds. We also offer tools and free training courses. Plus, we've been ranked highest in investor satisfaction among self-directed brokerage firms by J.D. Power. Visit Disnap.com. Certain conditions apply. For J.D. Power 2023 award information, visit JDPower.com slash awards. Doug Ford did not have a great year, but you wouldn't know it from the polling um, because Doug Ford, according to the last couple of Abacus polls, is somewhere between 39 and 41 percent, although he's got a new leader now. Uh, Corey, you are intimately involved in the Doug Ford campaign. You helped run or did run. You, I guess you were the campaign manager in the 2022 campaign, and, and you're still involved with uh, advising the government now. How the hell did he go from losing multiple cabinet ministers, screaming headlines in, in the papers, denouncing them story after story, looking like he was, it, well, he was following in the polls, both your, the public polls and your own internals from what I've been told. And now he's back on top. What the hell happened? Uh, he apologized in reverse course on some things that, that, uh, the public wasn't with him on. And, uh, uh, and that's not something that you see happen a lot in politics, but uh, and it's not something that I think every political leader can can pull off the way that that, that Ford does. And I think there's you know one other politician that comes to mind uh, who's who had a, a track record of being able to do the same, and that and that would be Ralph Klein. And I, I think they share a bit of a political persona in a way. Um, they're kind of populist conservative guys who who. Um, you know, while everyone in politics has an ego, don't have an ego so large as to not be able to say, oops, I got it wrong, and and course correct. So I, I think that's, you know, why is he back? Why was he down? Well, he, he did something that he said, you know, he promised the lecture he wasn't going to do, and he didn't, you know, lay the groundwork for that change. Uh, and uh, and people were upset. People pe pe people don't like it when you, when you reverse course on something, you know, that they voted for. Uh, you on the assumption that you were going to keep your promise, and uh, you know, and you didn't. So that, that's that gets people offside with you pretty quickly. I, I think I'm the only person complaining that he reversed course because <laughs> I actually thought it was a good plan, and, and I wrote about that extensively. But uh, of course, we're talking about the green belt issue, uh, where uh, the Ford government uh, said that they would allow housing development because of the housing crisis to go on what is currently protected land. Uh, Warren, you've been around a lot of politicians over the years. How many of them like to apologize? Well, he didn't just apologize. <clears throat> and, you know, Brian, as you and I were talking about on my podcast a few days ago, like he didn't just apologize. He went on TV and said, I broke a promise. And I remember when he said that, I like I actually audibly had an intake of breath. It was like, holy shit. Like, you know, you see politicians kind of prevaricating and dissembling all the time on getting things wrong or walking something back. This was a full on, I broke a promise to you. And 
I can't think of many examples of politicians doing that in my lifetime. And I think the reason why not only did he benefit from that, because he did, you know, the polling afterwards showed that, you know, he was nearly double where his, his opponents were in the legislature, is because of his persona. And, you know, at the start, when I first met Doug, I didn't particularly like him. I didn't like his brother and the way his brother behaved. And, um, you know, I got to know him on panels like this one. You know, you get to know people. You chat during the commercial break and, and stuff like that. And when we were all on, you know, the Sun News Network, I got to know him even better there. And he's he's got a good heart. You know, my mom was a Montreal liberal, Irish Catholic liberal. Like, you know, being liberal is in your DNA. That's as hardcore she, as you get. And she loved him. And I said to her, why do you love him? And she said, there's a genuineness about him. He wears his heart on his sleeve. And he was a lot like Kretschia, you know, like his diction and his grammar is not perfect. And he's, you know, sometimes a funny looking guy. And, you know, he doesn't say the right thing. And But people like that about politicians, like, you know, Klein, who you just mentioned, or Levesque, or, you know, somebody, Mel Lastman. People like that, they feel closer to those people because they seem more human. Kretschian. Yeah, like the candidates I I don't like working for are the ones who look like, you know, quarterbacks who always got the girl (laughs) in high school. Like they're harder to work for because people have far less tolerance for them making mistakes. Whereas these guys, the regular schmoes, you know, the hell of a guy guys. And, you know, I think Ford has got that. And I think Bonnie Crombie, who I know and I like, is grossly underestimating Doug Ford's strength, you know, because of his connection with regular people. Let's talk about Bonnie Crombie. Um, met her back when she was first elected around 06, I think she was, was when she came to, to the Hill. And a backbench liberal MP in the opposition side. Uh, she has really moved up, you know, mayor of Mississauga, one of the country's biggest cities. Now the Ontario liberal leader, she can raise money in ways that the previous, uh, you know, liberal leader couldn't. They, they haven't been in, the liberals have been in such bad state in Ontario that the last time they were the, uh, the leader in fundraising was 2015, Corey. And they were in government for three years after that. So what do you make about Crombie? I, you know, obviously you're going to be uh, working to keep your guy in, in power, but how big of a threat is she? Well, I guess we're going to find out. Um, she's not particularly well known. She's, she has a following in, in particular in the Western GTA and a little bit more in the GTA as a whole, but the rest of the province, when you do a focus group and you show her a picture and say, who's this? Uh, people, you know, have a puzzled look on their face and guess things like real estate agent. <laughs> um, you know, like she, so I think she's, she's, you know, going to have a period of having to introduce herself to the public. And, and unlike the situation we were talking about with, uh, with Trudeau and Polyev, um, uh, as a campaign manager, I'm not going to make that mistake. Uh, we're going to introduce her in a very thorough and systematic way, uh, with paid advertising and, and we'll see what, what things look like at the end of that. But, you know, I, I think there's some inherent weaknesses and I think, uh, um, uh, Warren sort of put his finger on a number of them. You know, we're, we're in a cost of living crisis right now. We're in a, in a crisis where, of affordability and housing and all the rest, and um, she does not present as somebody who understands those things or is concerned about those things. And when it comes to, 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 to some of the larger issues, yeah, and when it comes to some of the larger issues like carbon tax, she's on the wrong side of them. Before I go to, to you, Warren, I want to hear from Corey quickly on this. I've been saying, you know, since it became apparent she was going to win, that she's, at first, she's going to be a bigger threat to Merritt Stiles the leader of the NDP and the official opposition, then she will be to Ford. Maybe one day she'll get to the point where she's, you know, threatening the Ford government, but she's going to take away all the oxygen in my view. Corey, what's your take on that? Because I mean, one of the things you've benefited from or Ford has just like Cretchen did very ineffective opposition. I mean, the, the Ontario NDP is perhaps the worst official opposition I've ever seen in 20 years of covering politics across the country. 
Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect situation right now of two parties at about 25% each in terms of the opposition. And when you have that, then you start winning a lot of seats that you probably, in a normal election, have no business winning. But, you know, I would say this, the Liberals are always a bigger threat. Even when, even when, the, Lib- even when the NDP are in second place by, by a bit, which is, you know, what we've seen in the last two provincial election campaigns, it's, uh, the Liberals have a higher voter ceiling. Uh, I, I believe that the, the voter ceiling for the NDP in Ontario is probably around 35%, which is, you know, five or 6% short of what you need to, to ever form a government. And that is a quite a hard cap. You know, uh, we've seen, you know, Horvath, especially in 2018, was bumping her head against the top of that voter ceiling that they have, but she could not get past it. And, and uh, I think that exists for Merritt Stiles as well. I think it's it's almost you know baked into to the you know current Ontario electorate that uh, there's just too many people who are unwilling to go uh, go with NDP. So you know you, you need to focus more on the Liberals because they are inherently your bigger threat. Uh, Warren, your thoughts on Bonnie Crombie as a threat to Stiles and the NDP, and then Ford? Uh, well, I agree, Brian, with what you said earlier. Um, like, you know, politics, <laughs> it, it can be really hard. And when you have nine seats, it's particularly hard. You know, the Ontario Liberal Party, for those of us uh, who are blessedly listening to this podcast from outside Ontario, just to emphasize the point, the once mighty Ontario Liberal Party, and I, full disclosure, ran their three war rooms for McGinty, like, it, you know, we were always starting from a base of several dozen seats or dozens of seats. And um, Bonnie is not. She's got nine seats. I cannot recall an instance in Canadian history where somebody went from nine seats to being a majority government. You can't in a single election cycle. Like, I don't think that can be done. Even if everything goes right for her and everything goes wrong for Doug Ford, that's really, really hard. So I think she's looking, you know, she's smart and she's not a dummy at two election cycles. Like it's going to take her a while to get to that point. Maybe Doug won't be there anymore. Who knows? But, you know, is she going to displace the NDP? Yes, I believe she's going to do that. Is she going to form government? That's pretty hard to do. All right. Uh, so 2024 in Ontario politics, we'll be watching Ford versus Crombie all year. Uh, Notley versus Smith. You know, earlier this year, Corey, uh, it looked like Danielle Smith was not going to win the Alberta election. She was, in my view, relitigating the pandemic at a time when voters just, you know, as you as you guys rightly did in the 2022 election, voters were done with the pandemic. They didn't want to hear about it anymore. And maybe there's a small base that did. But um, then she started talking about issues that mattered and, and she ended up winning. Uh, what does she need to do to, you know, keep things going in 2024 other than fighting with Ottawa? Well, fighting with Ottawa for sure, but it's it's on on a carefully selected set of issues. Like I, I think where she turned things around, Brian, is uh, when she brought out some new campaign management, and they they turned from fighting on uh, the Sovereignty Act, which which you know one in four Albertans supported, and started to, you know fighting on issues where they had three quarters of people supporting them. Um, are namely around the Just Transition uh, initiative, which was basically a plan to put uh, everyone with a job on 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 employment insurance and and wind down the largest sector in the Ontario or sorry in the Alberta economy. So, like I I think she made some good choices, and I think she's made some good choices on pushing back uh, against uh, the electricity uh, regulations that uh, the federal government has brought forward. I think she's been winning the, the you know the media spin war on that, uh, and looking like she's you know standing up for the Alberta economy and standing up for uh, regular folks who need to pay their their home heating bill. So, but but she's she's pushing on the pension, which doesn't appear to be popular, and she appears to have to do that to keep groups like Take Back Alberta happy. I would say she's half pushing on it. Like you know, you're not seeing that in the window to the same extent, and I and I agree. I assume that the part of that is is uh, keeping a, a very 
uh, volatile base within her own party uh, at bay. Uh, but, you know, she's not, she's not been going out and doing press conferences on that. You know, she's basically handed it off to Jim Denning and has it on a, you know, on a spur line going down a different set of tracks than, than what she's out there messaging on herself. Warren, your take on, on Smith, I mean, you know that fighting against Ottawa can be popular in certain parts of the country. And as a Calgarian, you know, it works in Alberta. Uh, is she, as Corey said, selecting the right issues on things like the electricity grid, the just transition and so on? Yeah, for sure. But, you know, taking a swing at Ottawa, <clears throat> like it's a time honored Canadian tradition, like everybody does it and it and it works. So it's not some special act of genius that she's she's doing that. I really, I, I just don't like her because I am an Albertan. And I don't like the shorthand that people in the rest of Canada always perform on us that, you know, we're, we're kind of kooky and extremists and so on. And because she, she actually fulfilled that role, you know, initially siding with Vladimir Putin and all of the nonsense she was saying about COVID and vaccines. And like she, she was going to lose if Jason Kenney hadn't saved her. Jason Kenney saved her. He united the two warring factions of the right in the province of Alberta. He did that. He didn't get credit for it, but she derived the benefit for it. Had the Jason been unsuccessful in bringing together the PCs and Wild Rose, she, Daniel Smith would not be premier of Alberta, period. So, like, it's not, as I say, something, some great strategic sense that she had. It's Jason Kenney you know, created but, the road for her and she drove it. But she, in my view, she's uh, toned down some of the, the bits that were making her look kooky to people outside Alberta. And she's coming across in these fights with Guibault and Trudeau as very, very tame, very moderate. No, I don't think she's very moderate. I mean, it, it's like, she's always refighting the old war, right? It's like, honey, you know, you're, you're premier now and we get it, you know, everybody, you know, in your caucus hates, hates Trudeau and he's a useful foil for you. But, you know, we do want you to focus on the stuff that Corey was talking about earlier, which is, you know, the pocketbook stuff and so on. Like I've worked in the oil patch. I've represented the oil patch. You know, I believe it is an integral and key and critical part of the Canadian economic structure. Um, but I just think the way she goes about doing it is, is all wrong. And, um, you know, like, for example, the province of Alberta, when Peter Lockheed was there, uh, was not considered anathema in the province of Quebec, which, you know, whether we like it or not, has 70 plus seats and some considerable constitutional clout within this, you know, the way this country is put together. And, like, it's just successive kind of kooky policy stuff has completely alienated the province of Quebec from Alberta. And I think Warren is currently alienating part of our listening audience. Yeah, well, they, you know, yeah. they can come and kiss my ass because it's what I think. <laughs> like, I don't give a shit. But, but, but th this is why I wanted to have both of you on. Look, we, we're, we're three guys that can talk all day, uh, but we are up against the clock for, uh, for Corey having to go somewhere else. So I appreciate both of you coming on. Thank you both so much. And uh, in, enjoy the holiday season. Enjoy the, the new year. And, uh, and we'll talk more politics in 2024. Merry Christmas and happy Hanukkah. Merry, Merry Christmas. Uh, have, have a great holiday season, you guys. All the best. Well, hopefully that was uh, an entertaining uh, 45 minutes or so of talking Canadian politics. We hope you enjoyed it. And we hope that you spread the word about Full Comment. Full Comment is a post-media podcast. My name's Brian Lilly, your host. This episode was produced by Andre Pru with theme music by Bryce Hall. Kevin Libin is the executive producer. You can subscribe to Full Comment, and we encourage you to do that on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Amazon Music, wherever you get podcasts. You can listen through the app or your Alexa-enabled devices, and help us out by giving us a rating, leaving a review, and telling your friends about us. Thanks for listening. Until next time. I'm Brian Lilly.